Hello there, and welcome to episode 4 of this video lecture series on the problem of evil. Today, we're going to learn about skeptical theism. We want to do three things in this video. First, we want to provide a basic introduction to the idea of skeptical theism. Second, we want to explore a few variations of skeptical theism, especially as those variations have developed in response to the evidential problem of evil. Finally, we want to offer a critical evaluation of skeptical theism. What are its promises and what are its drawbacks? All right, Carl, let's roll it. Make it happen, baby. The term skeptical theism is a bit of a misnomer. It almost sounds like it's referring to people who are skeptical about their belief in God. But the term actually refers to those who believe in God, yet are skeptical about the extent to which human knowledge can actually understand God or claim to understand God. In other words, the skeptical theist believes that we ought to be cautious about our claims about God, especially our claims about God that suggest we know God definitively or absolutely. Now to clarify, the skeptical theist does not claim that we can't have any knowledge of God. On the one hand, there is certain things we might know about God through reason, and on the other hand, there are certain things that God maybe has revealed about God's self historically. For example, a Christian skeptical theist would claim that we can know certain things about God based on how God has revealed God's self in the Hebrew scriptures and through Jesus Christ. The important thing to note here is there is a limit. We are finite human beings trying to understand some infinite being. And it therefore stands to reason that we might have limited access to who God is and what God is up to. In particular, we might have limited access to God's reasons for doing what God does. Skeptical theists basically make two claims. First, if God does exist, an omnipotent, omniscient, all-loving, perfect in all ways being, if this God exists, there's gonna be a huge gap between this God and human beings. This God has way more knowledge than we can ever hope to attain. This God has an awareness of everything that's happened in the universe, everything that is happening in the universe, possibly everything that will happen in the universe. So it stands the reason that human beings, who only have a very small, flawed grasp of what's occurring in the universe, might not be able to understand the big picture the way that God understands the big picture. From this first claim follows a second claim. A variety of evidential arguments from evil, which rely upon the claim that humans can have some level of confidence in suggesting God has no good reason for allowing certain things to occur, are going to fail. Let's unpack this by looking at a few examples. The first variation of skeptical theism we want to look at was put forward by Stephen Weikstra. Weikstra developed his understanding of skeptical theism in response to the evidential argument from evil offered by William Rowe. You'll recall from episode 3 that Rowe argued that there are particular gratuitous evils that occur in the world. These evils are gratuitous because it doesn't seem like any good comes out of them, and it doesn't seem like God stopping them would create some greater evil. In this sense, they're unnecessary. God's project could go on unaltered and feasibly better if God had stopped these evils, and yet God doesn't stop them. From this claim, Roe argues, well, it seems very unlikely that there is an all-powerful, all-knowing, loving God. Now let's recall a few things about Roe's argument. First, it's based on evidence. That is, he is taking specific instances of suffering that occur in the world, and he's using these as evidence that gratuitous suffering actually exists. But Roe's argument also relies on an inductive inference. That is, because humans can't see a reason why God would allow the suffering, because humans can't see any good that comes out of it, or any good that seems to be dependent upon this suffering, the inference is, well, there must be no good that is dependent upon these sufferings. That is, Rowe's claim that these instances are gratuitous evils is an inference based on human beings not being able to locate a particular good that justifies the evils occurring. Again, the example of the fawn comes to mind. If there is a fawn in some forest who is slowly dying by being burned alive in a forest fire, what good would be lost if God somehow prevented this fawn from dying in this way? What greater evil would occur if God healed the fawn's wounds? It doesn't seem like any good would be lost or any greater evil would occur. So why doesn't God heal the fawn? Now, Weichter responded to this argument in a very interesting fashion. He didn't offer some good that justified the evils. He merely noted that Rowe's inference is not justified. He argued this based on a phrase that we summarize with the acronym CORNEA. 
Cornea stands for the much less marketable phrase, condition of reasonable epistemic access. I know, Carl, I made bumper stickers and pins with that saying on it, and they did not sell well. They didn't. Of course, neither did my Cornea pins. I gotta rethink my whole business model, I think, Carl. It's, something's not right here. In its most basic sense, Cornea refers to the idea that we can only make the claim something appears to be true if we are justifiably confident we would be able to tell if it weren't true. An example here will help. Imagine that you walk into a dentist's office and sit in the chair. The dentist pulls out those horrible tools that dentists use, including the one that looks like a hook. A hook, Carl. It's just a big, sharp metal hook and they just ram it in your mouth. I'm okay. I'm okay. It's just, I, you know, I have, I have, D dentist, I, it's, it's a thing, man. I, I, I have trouble with it. Now imagine as the dentist is about to put this hook in your mouth, he or she drops it on the floor. The dentist picks it up, looks at the hook and says, yeah, I don't see any germs on there. I'm coming in. At that point, you might say, whoa, whoa, wait, 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 doctor. I know you don't see germs on there, but germs are also kind of microscopic. So do you really feel confident that you not seeing germs on the hook you're about to put in my mouth? is strong enough evidence that there aren't germs on there? That is, if there were germs on the hook, wouldn't it look the same to you? In other words, because the dentist, as a human, cannot with plain sight see germs on the tools that he or she is using, that dentist can't, with any reasonable degree of confidence, make claims about whether there are actually germs on the hook or not. And the reason is that their faculties of knowing, in this case, the faculty of sight, is not good enough, is not strong enough, is not developed enough to be able to see microbes on an instrument. Weichstra says the same is true of Rowe's inference about God's reasons for allowing or not allowing evil. In essence, the gap between God and human beings is so great that human beings should not anticipate being able to see or understand the reasons why God would allow certain things to happen. In other words, just because humans can't see any goods that might justify God and allowing these evils to occur doesn't mean that there are no goods that would justify God in allowing these evils to occur. It just means that human beings, as finite creatures who have a very limited amount of knowledge, maybe can't see or understand God's greater purposes. In response to Weikstra, Rowe further developed his argument a bit. Rather than saying, well, we don't see any reasons, there appear to be no reasons, therefore there probably are no reasons, Rowe simply made the inference no good reason that we can understand justifies God in allowing the evils to occur, therefore there probably are no good reasons. This shift in Rowe's argument led to another development in skeptical theism. This time the argument was developed by William Alston and Michael Bergman. Essentially these authors argued, we cannot make an inductive inference unless we feel like we have a good enough sample size in order to justify the inference. Let me use an example to make this case. Imagine that NASA found microbial life on the moon. Then imagine that NASA also found a variety of microbial life on Mars. Millions and millions of different kinds of life forms on the moon and on Mars, but all of them microbial, all of them simple. Now imagine that NASA came forward and then confidently declared, we have found no intelligent life outside of Earth. Therefore, there is no intelligent life, or there probably is no intelligent life outside of Earth. It would be really hard to justify making this inference because essentially the only life that we're talking about is the life that we found on Mars and on the moon. And certainly that's a small sample size when you consider the vastness of the universe. In essence then, Alston and Bergman are arguing that Rowe's claim that there probably are no good reasons for God allowing the evil is analogous to NASA's claim that there probably is no intelligent life out there in the universe. The sample size is too small. We just don't know what possible goods exist because we have such a limited finite knowledge. We have no idea what possible evils could exist, again, because we have a limited finite knowledge. So it's difficult for us to say there are no possible goods. For all we know, we have a very small understanding of the goods that exist in the universe, and God's understanding of the goods that exist, or the goods that actually exist, is much, much larger. Our sample size isn't big enough to make the claim. Now again, for Alston and Bergman's argument to work, 
they don't have to demonstrate that we don't have a big enough sample size. They just have to demonstrate that it's probable that we don't have a big enough sample size. Let's shift gears now and look at Draper's evidential argument from evil. You'll recall that Draper's argument essentially boils down to the idea that the notion that God created the world does not fit the evidence of evil existing, as well as some other claim about how the world came to be. In other words, there's a certain amount of evidence in the world, these evils that occur, that makes the explanation of God, omniscient, omnipotent, loving, perfectly good, less feasible. And there are other explanations that fit this evidence better. In sum, Draper compares two different hypotheses. On the one hand, there's the hypothesis that an omnipotent, omniscient, perfectly good God created the world. On the other hand, there's a much broader hypothesis. Something else happened. Now, when we look at the evidence of evil, the question is which hypothesis makes better sense of the evidence of evil? The hypothesis that an omnipotent, omniscient, perfectly good God created the world, or the hypothesis that something else happened? Draper's argument is that the hypothesis that something else happened fits the evidence better. Therefore, because the evidence we're talking about, evil, actually exists, God probably doesn't exist. A very interesting form of skeptical theism developed in response to Draper's argument, and it was developed by Peter Van Inwagen. Inwagen relies on modal logic to make his argument, so let's take one brief moment to really understand what modal logic refers to. Modal logic refers to statements that either deal with necessity or possibility. Something is necessarily true, something is possibly true. For example, I could say, well, I became a college professor, but I could have possibly become something else. I could have become a musician, I could have worked retail, I could have done a number of things. It's not necessary that I ended up being what I am. There are other possibilities, other modal expressions. I could possibly have done A, B, C, D, so on and so forth. Now then, Inwagen essentially says, when we make these modal claims about what possibly could have been the case, the further we get from what we know about reality, from our experiences of everyday reality, the more difficult it is to make these claims with any level of confidence. So while I could say, for example, I could have possibly become a musician, it's much more difficult for me to say I could have existed in a world with a completely different structure of cosmic regularities. It's just much more difficult to make claims about that because our knowledge is so limited, and it's so far from our everyday experiences of reality. When it comes to Draper's claims, Inwagen basically argues, we're not really in a position to say with any high level of certainty whether or not theism, the belief that God exists, fits the evidence of evil or not. Because it's possible for us to imagine there might be a version of theism that makes sense of the evidence. If there is a version of theism that can make sense of the evidence of evil, how could we know whether that version of theism is true or not? For example, imagine a version of theism that looks like this. The only world God could create in which intelligent sentient creatures lived that wasn't massively irregular was a world that would inevitably result in a high level of suffering and evil such like occurs in our world. It's possible that this is true, and we have no way of knowing whether it is true or not. So how can we say another hypothesis fits the evidence better? Having considered three variations of skeptical theism, let's give it a brief critical analysis to see if we can understand what its promises and what its drawbacks are. The first thing we can note about skeptical theism is it essentially approaches the evidential argument from evil similar to the way that the free will defense approaches the logical argument from evil. That is, the goal is not necessarily to defend the claim that God exists. The goal is more to attack the claim that God does not exist. In other words, to attack the argument that leads to the conclusion God does not exist or God probably does not exist. Skeptical theism does this by essentially saying our claims about what probably is true hinge upon an inductive inference that we really have no business making. And the reason we have no business making them is because we are very limited, finite human beings trying to understand the ways of an infinite God. Now the basic position of skeptical theism actually makes perfect sense. We cannot make confident assertions about reality if we don't have a high level of confidence in our ability to actually assess that reality. So I could certainly walk into a room, look around the room and say, there are no other human beings in this room. But I can't walk into a cluttered room, look around and say, there are no spiders in this room. After all, if there were spiders, I probably wouldn't see them. And the room would look exactly the same to me, even if the spiders were there. But if there were humans in the room, theoretically speaking, I would feel much more confident that I would be able to see them. So I'm justified in saying there are no humans in the room, 
but I'm not justified in saying there are no spiders in the room. With regard to God, then, we cannot feel overly confident about saying there are no reasons that justify God's allowing these evils to occur, or that a hypothesis that something else occurred better fits the evidence than a hypothesis that God exists and God created the world. To highlight the drawbacks or weaknesses of skeptical theism, I want to briefly consider four basic arguments. First, when Weichscher developed his response to William Rowe, he used a parent-child analogy to make the case. He said that the difference between God and human beings is, at bare minimum, the difference between an adult human being and an infant. And just as we wouldn't expect an infant to understand an adult human being's ways, so also we cannot expect a human being to understand God's ways. Now, Rowe responded to this by saying that kind of backfires, actually. Now, recall that Weichstra accepts that God could reveal things to human beings about God. God could make things known to us. Now, consider that parent-child analogy. If I'm a parent, and I have a child, and the child is experiencing suffering, and I'm allowing the suffering to occur, but I also know why I'm allowing the suffering to occur. Say I take them for a medical procedure that is necessary to save their life. I'm going to explain to the child why the suffering is occurring, why I'm not stopping it. I'm going to be extremely near to the child in the child's suffering. But this doesn't seem to be the case with the evidence that Roe puts forward of examples of gratuitous suffering in the world. If God does have reasons for allowing these evils to occur, why doesn't God explain them to us? And aside from explanation, why does God not demonstrate clearly that God is beside us while we suffer? Now, of course, some may say, I know that God is beside me while I'm suffering, but there are plenty out there who would love to have God next to them while they're suffering, but feel nothing. This is the problem of divine hiddenness. What of those who want to experience God, but don't? In essence, then, one problem with skeptical theism is it doesn't explain why God doesn't attempt to explain to us why evil occurs, or what goods are at stake in allowing us to suffer. Another problem could be raised in response to Van Inwagen's argument. Van Inwagen argues that, well, it's possible to imagine that there are versions of theism in which no other world could exist other than a world that has as much suffering as ours, or at least something comparable to as much suffering as ours. But this seems kind of counterintuitive. We can imagine a world, just like ours, where God intervenes to stop suffering. In fact, the Bible seems to be fairly filled with these kinds of things, right? God will raise people from the dead. God will heal people from blindness or sickness. Why doesn't God do that more consistently throughout the world? In other words, it's not only possible to imagine a world in which there is much less suffering because God is intervening to heal people, we have a very image of that world in the Bible itself. So why doesn't that world exist? Why isn't God intervening to save children from cancer? Why don't we see God's hand, especially in these instances of extreme gratuitous suffering? A third issue with skeptical theism is it seems like it could possibly justify almost any kind of world. Imagine for a second a world like ours in all other aspects except that there is 10 times as much suffering. Now imagine in that world there's somebody like Roe or Draper who says, well wait a second, the claim that God exists and that God is all-powerful and all-good and all-loving doesn't really fit this evidence very well. Or look at all these instances of evil or the sheer amount of evil, again, 10 times as much as our world. It seems probable that God doesn't exist given this evidence. And then somebody like Van Inwagen or like Weichstra says, well, we really don't know. Maybe God has reasons for allowing this amount of suffering. In essence, it seems like the argument from skeptical theism could possibly justify almost any kind of hellish world that could exist. The fourth problem I want to raise with skeptical theism is it can cause a lot of skepticism in almost any area of life. For example, imagine I raise the possibility that God created a world that is extremely deceptive to human beings, such that our faculties of perception, our sight, our hearing, so on and so forth, almost always fail us, and everything that we think we know is wrong. On one hand, someone would say, well, God would never do that, right? God would never create a world that was so deceiving to human beings in that way, because that would be a great evil. It would deny us, essentially, our way of understanding the world. But then imagine I say, well, wait a second. Maybe God has a reason that justifies acting so deceptively. If we accept skeptical theism, it seems like we should be able to then acknowledge, well, wait a second, maybe God does have a reason for deceiving us in this way. And so we can have no great level of confidence that God has not deceived us in this way. 
that this world isn't some great farce that is completely deceptive to our human means of perception. And so in that sense, our confidence in knowing the world and accepting the world around us begins to crumble, all because we've tried to exonerate God in the face of evil. Now to be clear, there are plenty other variations of skeptical theism, just as there are plenty other variations of the evidential problem of evil. And also there are ways of responding to the issues that I've raised with skeptical theism, and there are ways of responding to those responses. But my goal in this video was to offer you a basic introduction to skeptical theism, highlight some variations of skeptical theism, and how they developed in response to the evidential arguments from evil, and finally offer a brief critical analysis of skeptical theism. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Goodbye.